Hello, hello. This is a special video because this is not only part four of our unit 11 uh, study of gases, but it is also the last content lecture video of the entire semester school year in chemistry. So just got a little bit more to go and we will be done. Now there'll be a couple more videos that review quizzes, review homework, uh, and of stuff of, of that nature, but this is the last of the new material that will be delivered in this format, um, or in any format, I suppose. So we left off looking at the combined gas law, uh, saying if we have a gas that is changing things like pressure or temperature or volume um, or the quantity in moles, then how can we figure out if we change some of them then what would the, the, the result be? And we got this law by the combined gas law by knowing that the pressure and volume divided by the quantity temperature times temperature, that it is always equal to a constant that we call R. So if some of these go up, the others can go down so that this, that this is a constant. So we could change these and this value stays the same. And so setting it equal to itself gave us the combined gas law. PV over NT initially is equal to PV over NT at some other set of conditions. Now for this one, what you, all you really need to know uh, and remember is that temperature when given in Celsius always has to be converted to Kelvin. So pressure we can plug in is we're going from one atmosphere to 0.33 atmospheres because as this balloon rises up to the top of Mount Everest, pressure drops. And we're going to see a corresponding um, decrease in temperature. And so again, we're going from 20 Celsius, which is 293 Kelvin. So that's when we add 273 to this. And it is going up to 200, or sorry, down 243. Now N, since we're saying this is a balloon, we're gonna say it has a fixed volume. No molecules of the gas can get in or out. So we can effectively just cross that out. We don't, we don't care. It doesn't matter how much there is. Um, and then finally, our V1 is given as seven. That's, I'm gonna do a, t that's a times, ugh. 7.1 liters right there, the size of a basketball. So plugging everything in, we then solve for V2. And so I'm trusting you can do the algebra yourself. And hopefully you came up with a value of 17.8 liters. Uh, that is the combined gas law. Because again, we, we see that it increases. Um, for It's increasing because we're seeing as the, as the pressure goes up, um, that, or sorry, as the pressure goes down, we know that's going to make the volume get bigger. That's Boyle's law. Um, but in the same time, as the temperature decreases, that would make the vol volume decrease. That's Charles's law. So taking these together, we find that um, it goes up to 17.8 with both factors contributing to it. So moving right along, we're now going to look at another gas law called Dalton's law. Now this one is super easy, I think, to understand. It's, it's almost kind of trivial, but I'll tell you in a second why it's important. So Dalton's law of partial pressures tells us that if you take two samples of gas and mix them together, that their pressure or volumes are going to be conserved. Um, assuming there's no reactions. So we've already talked about Avogadro's law, and that, that's kind of what this stems from. So since the only thing that determines the volume is the number of particles, not the chemical identity, it, when we add these together, we can see that 2.9 atmospheres, 7.2 uh, atmospheres, when adding these together, we get a total of 10.1 atmosphere. So there's some simple math for you. Um, again, that shouldn't be surprising. Now, the only reason I want to point out, and something I usually will ask about on the quiz and test that is notable, 
is, you know, yes, this makes sense. Like effectively like three plus seven makes 10. Sure. Well, this is not true for solids and liquids. Technically you can mix something like 95 milliliters of ethanol. Oh, that's not the number I wanted. Um, you can mix 50 milliliters of water and 50 milliliters of ethanol. And what, what does your normal math tell you it should add up to? 100, right? Well, you'll get 95 milliliters. And that's because in the condensed phases, like solids and liquids, the volume is dependent on how they mix together. In the gas phase, they're all equally separated by, you know, on average, the same distance from one another. So their own volumes don't matter. But in solids and liquids, how they mix and pack together will affect the density, uh, will affect the volume that they take up. So we can't say pressure and volume are absolutely conserved when we mix solids and liquids. That's only true of gases. So you can, you can think, of, think of a box that you fill with tennis balls and you can't get a single more tennis ball in there and you'd say, oh, it's full. Okay, but then if someone gives you a bucket of sand, could you pour sand in there? Sure, it will fit into the cracks and crevices. And so it wasn't completely full. And so if it can pack more tightly, then it can change the overall volume. So what we're gonna do with Dalton's Law is take this into account that if we know the partial pressures of individual gases, in total, it'll add up to a total sum pressure. Um, Actually, I'm lying. Fun fact for you, if you take college chemistry, we would do more of the math here, but I forgot I cut it out, but I remembered it. So I want you to know, again, this general concept is unique for solids and liquids, but I'm not going to make you do some of the fun math like finding mole fractions and stuff. You're welcome. So let's move on to gas density. So here's the ideal gas law. Uh, PV equals NRT, and let's rearrange it so that it's moles over volume is equal to P over RT, R is the constant. Now, this actually has the same unit of, it's the same units of molarity, like concentration, but we want to work it out to be density. So to make that happen, we're going to note that the molar mass of a gas or anything is grams per mole. When you look up at the periodic table and I said, hey, if it says that helium is four, for what? Well, four grams per one mole. So keeping this in mind, we can then substitute um, this N for that N. And so doing a little mathematics, we end up with this. So we can say the density, which is mass over volume, is equal to the pressure of the gas times the molar mass of the gas divided by a constant divided by temperature. So this is something very useful because if we were, well, if, if we need to identify a gas and we don't want to necessarily react it with something or try to burn it, if we simply measure the density, then we can figure out its molar mass. And that's, that's a huge piece of information to know its molar mass because then along with, if we also know the elemental composition, we can figure out the exact molecular formula. Um, so again, this is if we know the mass, if we measure the mass, which we can easily do, if we can measure the volume, the pressure, the temperature, again, then we can figure out the unknown molar mass. Now, I'm not gonna have you do a whole lot of math with it. Um, there was a lab that we would have done where we took um, butane and we fill up a container a, a, of known volume and then we weigh the change in mass of the gas so we get the density and then we'd figure out the pressure and the temperature and we would do all this to figure out to be able to say oh the molar mass of butane is and then you, you'd have an, a magical answer but we're not doing that um, because you know we're not here so I want you to at least know to know like how these factors, these variables change the density of a gas. You know that more dense gases sink to the bottom. Uh, it's a shame we didn't get to do the dry ice lab. It's one of my favorites where we get to make a dry ice bomb and 
make dry ice bubbles and it's, it's just good fun. Um, but one thing you find with dry ice is that as it's giving off this gas, it's very, it like sinks to the floor. You know, typically when you think of smoke or other stuff in the air, it rises, but um, carbon dioxide, which is that gas, it has a larger molar mass of 44 grams per mole than air because air, which is oxygen weighs 28 grams. Oh, that, that's, that's wrong. Nitrogen, the other component is 28 grams. Oxygen is 32 grams. They are lighter than carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is because it is more massive. It's also more dense and the more dense things will fall, uh, to the ground faster. So as the mass goes up, so does the density. So know that relationship. Um, the other relationship is pressure. Now I feel like this makes sense. If you pressurize a gas, what you're effectively doing is moving the particles closer together to make it more dense. So again, we can see that in the numerator as pressure goes up, so does the density, which is why we said some gases that have high density are are, are non-ideal, but another way you can make a ga any gas non-ideal is increasing the pressure because then you increase the density. The other factor is temperature. Now this is the only one that has an inverse relationship. So as temperature goes up, the density goes down. Now this is because as temperature goes up, you know from Charles's law, the volume is going to want to expand. And so Again, if temperature goes up, volume goes up, that the same mass over a larger volume is a lower density. Again, that's why, you know, again, thinking of, um, of what type of air balloon do you want to float in? You don't use a cold air balloon. You know, you fill that balloon up with hot air. So you have this fire underneath. And so you have hot, hotter air inside than you do outside. And that air is going to have a lower density, making it more buoyant. So higher the temperature, the lower the density. Um, now here's actually the, this is the same thing, just rearranged. So this is the form we would have used for a lab. Um, the molar mass is equal, it's just rearranged density times RT over P but we're not going to do it. So that's, that's sad. Now, the last thing I want you to, to get from this, you, you can, you can watch this video. You should, uh, but I'll generally ask, Hey, how did the water get up in the sky? If you think about clouds, clouds are, it's like an entire ocean above your head. And that's kind of weird to think about. So how did it get up there? Now, you know, the water cycle, I, I hope you do. My, my kindergartner knows it. So there's evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and just cycles. But again, the thing is when water evaporates, and I already had the numbers up here a second ago, water is lighter. We said it's only 18 grams per mole compared to 32 and 28 for, for air. So as soon as water evaporates, it rises up because it has a lower density. But eventually when it gets cold enough, it condenses into little droplets and then, then there's precipitation back down. Uh, but again, that, that only happens because water is, it's as a molecule is lower in mass, which makes it have a lower density. So if you had a water vapor balloon, it would float like a helium balloon in air except the water would have to be really hot and would that would probably melt to pop your balloon so i don't really know how to do that either way <clears throat> moving on again you're in luck because if if um if this was college chemistry we would play around with some of this math and do some questions i mostly just want you to know these relationships um yep yeah, just know that and we'll forego the math uh, now, the last thing in this chapter is gas stoichiometry. That's a big fun word that we remember from unit six. So stoichiometry was the quantitative way to figure out how many grams of something we start with could make how many grams of something we end with. 
So again, we, we talked about it as being the recipe. So if I have this many ingredients, how many cookies could I make? And how much of each one would we need? Now, there's, we can technically, we could use the same strategy we did before. We can go from grams of substance A, convert to moles of A, then we can convert moles to B, so the other thing, and then we could convert that to grams. But with gases, we can do it a little differently. Now, we could use the ideal gas law. So figure out the vol from the volume, we could then figure out how many moles of reactant there are, that's N. And then to go from moles of reactant to product, we find the mole to mole ratio. Hopefully you remember where we get that. That's the balanced equation. And then once we know moles of product, we could then use the ideal gas law to go from moles back to volume to figure out how much we expect to get. Now we could do that, but that, that looks like a whole bunch of steps and that's not super helpful. So this is where we want to come back and look at Avogadro's law and say that we know that any gas volume is independent of its identity. So helium, nitrogen, methane, if they have the same volume at the same pressure at the same temperature, they have the exact same number of particles. They take up the exact same amount of space despite their masses being different. So what this allows us to do is when we look at a balanced equation, instead of reading it as a mole to mole ratio, we can take those exact same coefficients and read it not mole to mole, but volume to volume or liter to liter. Um, so we'll look at a practice problem, but again, this is a really easy calculation. And again, let me stress, this only works in the gas phase. Gas laws do not apply in the solid or liquid phase. I feel like that, that makes sense, right? That gas laws aren't meant for solids and liquids. Yeah. Okay. So let's try it. We have a volume. We want to know what volume of oxygen is required to burn 7.64 liters of acetylene gas. Um, and so we're starting off with 7.64 liters. Now, what we would typically do is we would need moles and then we'd convert to moles and then back to grams. But all we have to do is recognize, oh, that looks weird. You know, if two moles of acetylene reacts with five moles of oxygen, from Avogadro's law, we can say two liters of acetylene react with five liters of oxygen. So all we're doing is still taking those same coefficients. And so we have two liters of C2H2 can make react with five liters of oxygen and we get our answer, super easy. If the question would have asked about carbon dioxide, it would just be a two to four ratio. That, um, now, so yeah, and we would, yeah, just put in four. Now, what if it asked about water? So this is where I want you to, again, be thinking about the fact that this is gas stoichiometry. And what's that L mean? It means liquid. So liquids are not gases. So could we use the fact that it's a mole to mole, it's a two to two mole ratio? No, you cannot. So since water is a liquid, you cannot use this to solve for the liquid, but we can for anything that is from one gas phase to another. Okay, now this is where I would say, go ahead, solve it. I'm gonna just sit back and relax, maybe walk around and stare at you and make you feel uncomfortable but hopefully you're, you're, you could knock this one out. So we have the combustion of methanol and it says it's consuming 2.7 liters of it. So we would like to know, well, what volume of carbon dioxide gas would we expect to get produced if this is the case? So if you wanna go ahead and try it, hit pause. And then in a moment, I'm gonna show you the answer. Do, 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 Okay, we're back. Hopefully you have an answer. So here's how it looks. We recognize that 
we can say three liters of oxygen reacts to form two liters of carbon dioxide. So starting with 2.7 liters of oxygen, it reacts in a three liter to two liter ratio. We end up with 1.8 liters of CO2. It's that simple. You just look at the coefficients and we've already done that. And then we're finished. Now, here is a technique that we were going to use. I mentioned the lab. So um, I mentioned we were going to measure the gas, uh, the, the molar mass of butane. And what we would do is we will fill up a graduated cylinder with water upside down, uh, where you would say it has a volume of zero. And then we would put, we were going to take these butane gas containers, put them in a tub underwater and allow it release the gas. And so it would fill it up. So you'd eventually have a container that was completely filled with butane gas. Uh, from here, what we would do is uh, we would then reweigh the container that had the butane. And by looking at the change in mass, we would know what the mass is, how many grams of this gas are. And because it's a graduated cylinder, we would know the volume and at when, when the pressure, when, when you're in this open type of system, we know that the pressure is the same as atmospheric pressure. So effectively one. And then finally our temperature, we would measure with the thermometer. And with all of this fancy stuff, we can use the ideal gas law and the modified version is we could find the molar mass of butane. But again, we didn't get to do that. And that, that's okay. You have more time to play, I don't know, Fortnite or Minecraft or whatever. I, I don't know what you're doing with your extra time studying chemistry, maybe? Yeah. Anyway, so that was a technique. Um, so the last thing I have up here are some practice problems. Again, some of the things you'll see on the, the quiz and in, in, in the test. So be sure you can use this one. So this one utilizes the ideal gas law. So it tells you you have a sample of a gas you need to make sure you convert grams to moles. You convert milliliters to liters for volume. You record, re convert temperature to Kelvin. And then R is a constant. Uh, this second one, we worked one just like it in the notes, has um, the PV over, oh, that was supposed to be an N, NT. This is the combined gas law. So use that one. And then we just worked one just, actually, that might be the same one. Yeah, that's the same one. So that's not a great question to ask. Anyway, um, you should work those for just more practice or just work the ones in the homework. That, that's fine too. But with that, that is the end. If you want to know why your knuckles pop, here's a good video that talks about that. Um, I think you should definitely watch that. And la last thing, I skipped over this in the notes. I'm coming back to it. Um, a fun fact, application we find of the gas laws we find in scuba diving. If you've ever went scuba diving, one thing you might know is you, you can't just go buy scuba gear and go scuba diving, or at least you're not supposed to. It's highly regulated because it can be potentially very dangerous. Um, and the, the biggest danger is not from diving down deep. I mean, and watching and running out of air, which I suppose that is a hazard, but the biggest hazard is ascending too quickly. So when you dive with more air, with more water on top of you at, at higher depths, pressure goes up. Um, so there's more pressure on you. And what we know for the gas laws is that with higher pressure, it's going to make the gases inside of you get smaller and smaller. They'll take up less volume. Well, again, when you, as you dive, you can't do that <coughs> that quickly. So that's not a big hazard. But when you ascend, you can swim upward fairly easily. And as you go up, as the pressure drops off, this volume, um, as the pressure drops, the volume then goes up. Again, that's Boyle's law. And that's the real issue. So what can happen is you can come, you can get what's called the bends or decompression sickness. So the gas, gases that are inside you, they start expanding. Now there's, there's another gas law called Henry's law that also says that more, the more gases that were dissolved in your blood 
will also come out of solution. So when you get gases expanding uh, in your blood, your bloodstream, it forms blockages. So it essentially produces the equivalent of a whole body stroke where nothing, where blood can't move and it could be very, very bad. You can die from it. Um, it's very painful. If you survive, they'll put you in a pressure, pressure chamber and they'll repressurize you um, to bring your back body back to its good form. And then they will slowly release the pressure over a matter of days. And that's that's actually how you're supposed to ascend. Now, not days, but what you do is if you're deep sea diving, you swim up 10 feet and you stay there for a couple minutes to let your body equilibrate. And you go up another 10 feet and another 10 feet. So you do it in intervals to let your body adjust for the, the changing pressure. Another gross example of this, we see the blobfish. This thing lives a thousand feet below sea level. And it's been voted like the world's ugliest animal, which is kind of unfair because if you look at pictures of it down in its home environment, it doesn't look like this. It looks like a normal fish, but at, the, at <clears throat> its normal conditions, its body is used to 80 atmospheres, which is crazy high pressure. So you pull it up rapidly, all the gases inside of it start expanding and things start bulging out and it's, um, it's, it's very blobby. So that's, that's the blobfish. So again, you should watch videos about that. Anyway, that is it. That, that is all. I don't have anything left for you. Please send me email, uh, your questions. Um, we were, I'm always free to do the whole Google hangout meets that is on the Google classroom page. Uh, ask me whatever questions you have and I will be available. Anyway, take care. I'll again, the next couple of videos will just be going over homework and going over the quizzes to get ready for the upcoming test. Have a good day.